But it's called the rocket stove because that burn, and we'll hear this later when we light it, once it starts to suck the air in and burn in the back, you hear this Welcome to Create Your Own Paradise. We are a world schooling family of four. Normally, you can find us in this beautiful community called Malama in Portugal. But now, it's time to do some traveling again. Today, we're going to visit our old neighbors in their off-grid farm in Spain and delve into the science behind their unique, one-of-a-kind rocket stove that they have built. Today, I have the honor to be with a very good friend of mine that we met here during our Spain, uh, Spanish mountain years. And I would call him uh, off-grid geek. <laughs> this is true. I'm I, uh, somewhat to the frustration occasionally of my wife, I, I do get a kick out of uh, making things myself even when it might be more practical to buy them, <laughs> just for the entertainment of learning how to do it for yourself. It's a combination rocket oven and water heater and uh, outdoor space heater. Uh, so when we rebuilt our house, we decided we wanted to stop burning as much wood to heat the house, uh, so we went all for a solar heating system uh, so it has uh, based around a solar panels solar hot water panels on the roof and underfloor heating in the house so the majority of the year both the hot water and the, the heating to the house are just done with solar but uh, obviously there are some times of the year when that's not enough uh, and rather than install a, a wood burning stove in the house which is messy, it's inefficient, um, uh, it's romantic, but it's, it's not super practical, especially if you're only gonna light it a few times a year to, to heat the house. Um, you're putting a big hole in the house for the exit and a big hole in the house for the entry. Uh, it's kind of crazy. So we decided we'd try and build something to feed into the same system, uh, to feed into the, the hot water system. Uh, and we'd seen a lot of rocket stoves in lots of different places and read a lot about them. I've played around with a few experiments in the past uh, and we decided to try and build a, a rocket water heater. But we also felt like uh, if we were going to go to all the trouble of building something like this, we wanted it to do some other things as well. Uh, uh, so we wanted to have a nice warm space outside during the winter and we also wanted to be able to start getting away from using gas oven, uh, gas cooker to cook food in the house. Especially even in the summer when we don't really need the, the heating, but like heating, cooking, roasting something in the oven it really makes the house too hot. So having an outdoor oven is a, is a big improvement. Why is it called the rocket stove? Uh, okay, so the idea of a rocket stove is to create a, a wood burning stove that burns very, very aggressively and very hot. Uh, uh, rather than a traditional wood stove where you would lock down the oxygen once it starts to burn and get the thing to burn long and slow, which releases heat over an extended period of time. Um, uh, this is designed to do the opposite. And the reason is those long, slow burns, although they're efficient in, rem in, in heating your house, ultimately they're re re getting less energy out of the wood by starving the burn of oxygen. Um, and so, and it also means that you've, you've got this thing that's radiating a high amount of heat from uh, a central metal box, for example, that creates a rather uneven heat, um, uh, which can be one of the downsides of having a wood burner. So instead of doing that, what a rocket stove does is to use a special design to create a very, very hot burn, which you then capture in some other form of mass, for example, water in our case, or uh, the rest of the masonry of the, of the stove. And the way it works is that you build your fire, and this is, this is a particular design. This is a, a design made by a, a, a Dutch guy called um, Peter, Peter Berg, Peter van der Berg, I don't remember. Peter van der Berg. Yeah, yes. yeah. and uh, he, uh, he came up with the idea of making a rocket stove where you can put a lot of wood in at once instead of just feeding little twigs, which is kind of more convenient. So you build a fire in here, it starts to burn in this box uh, of fire bricks here but you can see at the back there's a narrow slit going through into a, a chamber at the back and that what what happens is that the the burning of the wood in the front releases it doesn't burn completely it releases some 
uh, carbon soot particles, some carbon monoxide gas, uh, and that gets sucked by the draft through into the back. And there's a little metal piece sticking up just in front of the slit, and that's connected to this little entrance down the bottom. What this does is to draw fresh new oxygen into the point where the gases are getting pulled through into the back, and that then starts a secondary burn uh, that burns up all that remaining carbon, all that remaining carbon monoxide in the back of the uh, of the stove. Um, if you can. We can't do it here because it would melt the camera, but like, if you have one that's open uh, and hasn't got the thing built around it and you can get a camera high enough above it, you can see inside the bottom of the heat riser, you get these tongues of flame that spiral up the heat riser, the chimney in the back, uh, as it's doing this kind of rocket burn, um, which is kind of cool, it's quite satisfying once it gets going. <laughs> yeah, it's like a flame hurricane in the, in the bottom of it. So that's all the gases mixing uh, and uh, with the, the oxygen and all the soot mixing with the oxygen and creating a volatile flammable mixture that can then burn in the, in the back of the, 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 the stove. And the concept is, is still quite new. Eh? I don't think it's older than maybe a couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, uh, I think the, the new modern understanding of it is relatively new. Uh, and it's, as you say, the last couple of decades and it's become very trendy in like permaculture circles especially. But I, I, I seem to remember reading something not that long ago where they've seen now designs that existed uh, thousands of years ago in oh, some really? cases yeah. where oh, we're people were doing <laughs> some, some stuff that was kind of similar so like the the, the basic idea uh, in different forms has been around for for many years but now we have more tools to to be able to do this uh, a little bit more scientifically a bit more structured Peter Peter van der Berg for example has a gas analyzer he's built dozens of these things and he's put the gas analyzer in, he can measure how much carbon's coming out, how much oxygen's coming out, temperatures at different points in the thing, and then really tweak and optimize and come up with some rules of design rules to how to build these. It's a fantastic website with like a big load of tables. He, this is more or less his design. So the core of this, so the firebox dimensions, the the, the uh, secondary air intake, the, the size of the chimney, the basic mechanism for constructing all of that part, and sort of to some extent the sizing of the rest of it is all drawn from his site. The heat exchanger part is an adaptation of somebody else who he, Peter, Peter's got on his website a bunch of applications of where people have built rocket stoves based on his designs and one of the guys built a rocket boiler that's uh, not exactly like this but similar the heat exchanger design so I took that and adapted that to make the heat exchanger uh, and then uh, yeah the rest of it there's a bit of um, our own invention because the the sizings weren't exact we we've got an oven and a heat exchanger and a bunch of stuff in uh, all working together which kind of changes the way the the heat output is used so we had to make some approximations and some of those have worked out and some of them yeah, could do with some tweaking but more or less it it functions uh, this is the the design that i made for the for the for the rocket so this is a cutaway what we'll what we'll see here is that the the fire starts here in the in the firebox uh, and it comes through the slit at the back of the firebox and it comes into this tall chimney here which is made out, out of castable refractory, refractory which is a, uh, a heat resistant concrete basically uh, and the one we had we used had a, a, a little bit of uh, vermiculite mixed in so it's a, it's a lighter weight and a bit more insulating and then that's wrapped in in this uh, uh, space blanket the, the um, uh, ceramic fiber blanket uh, that's a heat resistant uh, insulation material um, and the firebox is also wrapped in that and that keeps all the heat inside the burn uh, with the insulation wrapped around it. It comes out, you can't, I don't have in the plan the hole in the floor of the oven but it, that's where it comes out into this, uh, this box which is made of heat resistant fire bricks that are then insulated around. Here we installed this after the first time we cooked some pizzas because this floor of the oven doesn't get anywhere near as hot obviously because the heat goes straight up. So by having a, a plate over the top of the heat riser, we get a nice, really, really hot base that gives you a nice crispy pizza base. Uh, uh, and then the gas goes up and over and then starts to lose heat to the surrounding of the oven. Uh, and then uh, it comes across here through the heat exchanger and down into the main body of the oven. Or if we put the bypass in, 
actually goes through this hole here and goes straight into the body of the uh, of the of this stove here to heat the more of the bricks up and to not waste more of the energy uh, heating the water if we don't need to heat the water. Uh, and unlike the top here, where we've got insulation between two skins to keep the heat into the oven, at the bottom section here, which is a big open uh, sort of brick chamber, um, this is not insulated. So the idea is that any heat that's left in those gases is going to get transferred to the bricks very slowly uh, that will then radiate it out over the next 24 hours. And so this, once it gets hot, this stays warm for a day, basically. And then once that's uh, the, uh, the gases have circulated around in this brick chamber, it then goes out through this hole at the bottom, at the far side, uh, and into the bench that I'm now sitting on, which you can see uh, if I spin around here, you can see it comes out through this bench, and at the end here, this is where the chimney is, and then it comes out uh, and goes up out into the, into the atmosphere. And this is, turns on its head all of the, the things that you've learned about making a flue for a, a stove. Because it goes down. Because it goes down. People go like, this, this can't work, this will never work. But the force with which the rocket burns is sufficiently powerful uh, that it can actually drive those gases through the rest of the system. And then you put a decent height chimney on the other end and that helps to generate a bit of draw uh, to pull them out as well. Um, when we first light it, we've, we've erred a little bit on the side of um, too much extraction of heat from this. And this was one of the things that uh, Peter commented when he saw the designs. Although we've got quite a lot of insulation, we've got quite a lot of bypass options, we are on the edge of taking too much heat out of the gases. And so when we first light it, it can be a little bit temperamental. Um, you can you leave the oven door open until it starts getting nice and hot so the gases have an easy escape path and then you shut it down slowly uh, and drive the gases through the rest of it. Once it gets going, it's perfect, but it just that first thing when everything's cold, it can take a little more persuasion to get going. And probably if we rebuilt it again, maybe we make the bench a bit shorter, maybe we make a, a little bit less mass in the, in the stove. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not a disaster, it's a, a, a kind of learning exercise. Uh, Peter's now got some new interesting designs. One of the other problems with this is the original design, there's a very strict relationship between the height of the heat riser in the back and the size of the rest of the stove. Can't make it any shorter than this, because otherwise you won't get the right draw through that heat riser. But he's now come up with a really cool kind of S-bend design that he calls a double shoebox rocket, because it looks like two shoeboxes stacked on top of each other. And this you can build in this height rather than this height, the same thing of this. So you can build them much more compact in a much smaller space. It's still kind of a work in progress. They're still kind of optimizing them and trying to work out what the best proportions are to build them. But Again, uh, maybe uh, another time if we built another stove like this for some other part of the project, we might try and experiment with one of those instead. The great thing about it is you get a really clean burn mm -hmm. because you burn all the trash normally the carbon may not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the idea is, I mean, it, obviously these things are always dependent on what you put in. If you, we don't have here kind of perfectly split bark-free wood that's kind of commercial timber type wood that would be 100% the best material that you can burn. We're burning lots of cut-offs and lots of random branches. The other day some of it was a bit wet because the rain came before we covered the wood pile. Um, so it depends what you put into it. Um, but relatively speaking, the burn that you're going to get out of this will be cleaner and hotter than the equivalent burn uh, in a, in a, for the same wood in a, in a normal stove. And as a result, you're extracting more energy um, from the same amount of material. Uh, the downside is it comes out very, very quickly, so you have to capture it. Uh, and that's why traditionally people haven't built stoves this way in a house, because uh, it's more convenient to have a stove that burns long or slow and releases that heat over 12 hours than it is to have something that burns in an hour uh, and burns the same amount of wood very, very quickly and generates a lot of heat that you then have to try and put somewhere else. But then if you build something like this, you can capture it and release that heat more slowly again uh, over the next 24 hours. So 
the the first and most important part of this was to build a we can go around the other side was to actually build a uh, a heat exchanger to allow us to heat water and that's what we can see in the side i've taken the side off to do some maintenance the the thing that's covered in soot here black uh, thing is a is a big stainless steel box uh, and the water goes in at the bottom and comes out at the top and it has 36 tubes running through the middle that uh, take the hot gases from the oven uh, and use them to heat the water. And there's a, a few plates inside to make the water do a serpentine path backwards and forwards. And this we got made uh, in Granada by a really good, they've got a whole bunch of fab labs there that do laser cutting, precision welding, all sorts of 3D printing, lots of different materials, really, really, really helpful guys. You just give them a design and they, they'll cut it all out on a laser cutter and weld it all together, it's fantastic. We've built it about, I think it was finished about a, a month ago maybe, uh, and we've tried it, or maybe not even that, maybe less than a month, and we've tried it a few times now. Uh, it's uh, still tuning it a little bit, but it cooks fantastic pizzas, really great bread. Uh, it does heat the water, not quite as fast as I'd hoped yet, but there's still some optimizations, one of which we're going to do today uh, that I think will, will improve it. The job for today, yes. So one of the things that we need to optimize is, and this is again something that we got from this guy who built the rocket boiler based on Peter's designs, was um, what he noticed is that uh, the gases that were going through the stove weren't transferring as much of their heat as they could do to the, the heat exchanger. And part of the reason for that is if you have a tube like this diameter and your gases are flowing through it and it has cold water around it, the, the skin of the gas that goes uh, down the outside of that tube uh, immediately gets cooled down by the cold water. But the core of the airflow is almost insulated by the outer airflow uh, and stays too hot and comes out the bottom and leaves through the chimney. So you're not extracting as much heat as you could do from that. So what he came up with is a super simple idea, which is to hang some chain. We bought some lightweight chain here that we're gonna do, do this with, just to hang it off a, a piece of wire through the middle of the tube. And it means that as the gas comes down, it's got an irregular uh, shaped uh, obstruction uh, that's gonna cause that gas to have a turbulent flow rather than a clean laminar flow through the tube. And that will hopefully mean, and he saw uh, when he tried this, a measurable difference in the output of his stove. It will mean that more of the hot gas gets into contact with the skin of the heat exchanger and transfers more of its energy to the water, which is where we want it. So I think we want to put about one meter. Well, yep. So the idea is we're gonna hang, gonna put a piece of wire across the top and we're gonna to hang that down like that and that will just act as a little turbulence creation. So I need 36 of these, which is gonna be, you might wanna do cut to later. So what we'll do is we'll put six, uh, I'm gonna get really nice and dirty doing this. <laughs> So there are six chains and we need to feed them in to the tubes at the back. The first few are going to be the hardest because they're right at the back. Things that would have been easier to do at the beginning, but hey hey, you live and learn. Oh, you can still get them out. Yeah, it's fine. This is one of the reasons why when we built this, we left this side open panel that goes over this, which is just over there. Uh, it's made of calcium silicate board, which is a heat resistant board uh, that we can just render eventually with a thin layer of lime render. Uh, and then if we ever have to get back into here, it's one board that we break and we open, we can remove this. We don't have to demolish a whole load of brickwork. You can see, uh, there you go. But that's gonna stay in place nicely, I think, no problem. Um, this is another, you can see another case here. This is a, a danger point. This is a very narrow tube. Um, that gets uh, right at the top of the heat exchanger. That's a point which could get super hot uh, and have a very small amount of water in it. And so there's a risk that that could boil and generate steam. Uh, and if it generates steam, although the whole system is open, uh, if it generates steam too intensely in one place, uh, there's a risk that it might 
uh, they will not be able to push the water through quickly enough. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, then there's a risk of it uh, causing a rupture because of the increase in pressure suddenly. Uh, interestingly, Peter uh, will not provide any advice on heating water with his rocket staves because he, although people do it and he freely acknowledges that it's possible, uh, he does not want to be involved in the liability of uh, providing any kind of advice to people. Uh, the one thing he says is don't heat small volumes of water because it's dangerous. Um, if you look at Jeff Lawton's uh, classic rocket stove design on the on the on the permaculture websites. He's doing something a, a, a bit more basic, but uh, um, very similar in in concept, which is that there's a a big uh, old water heater, which is a big volume of water that's directly over the heat riser of the rocket stove, and then there's a secondary coil that actually runs through the middle of that. Uh, but the important thing is, is that the rocket stove is heating uh, a big volume of water uh, as the primary thing it's heating rather than a small tube. Uh, people uh, sometimes do things like wrapping uh, a copper coil around a chimney, uh, which is, it can be okay with a normal stove, but even then you have to be very careful because you've got a 18 millimeter tube. It's a very narrow space. It can get very hot very quickly uh, and that can boil, flash boil to steam faster than you know and uh, then you can have a, a pressure build up and it can be very bad if it goes wrong <laughs> so um so in short you're putting in the metal slow down the air flow. yeah but not just slow down this is the important thing actually um the, the the airflow will slow down a bit but more importantly it will be turbulent it will be a, a chaotic flow where it's not just flowing cleanly straight down uh, the um, the tube and that means that more of the air uh, is going to end up in contact with the inside of the tube uh, which means that more of the the heat is going to get transferred to the water in the sleeve on the outside. Um, yeah, this is great that it will collect soot and then in the end maybe there's a lot of soot and then in one moment it will catch fire and... I mean... I guess it might, but like the, um, there's a, there's a, a lot of, um, hang on, uh, it's quite some distance in the oven, like before it's getting there. And if it did catch fire, it's a chimney fire, uh, effectively inside here, but there's really nothing to, it would be unfortunate, but it, it's not really going to damage anything too dramatically. It's not like having, this is one of the nice things about having a stove uh, outside the house, is uh, you can do a bunch of stuff like this uh, without damaging the envelope of the house, without putting things that are potentially messy or dangerous inside the house. Uh, so if something, if we had a chimney fire with this, it would burn and it would go out and that would be the end. It might conceivably damage the welds on the thing, but I think it's unlikely to be honest. It's a stainless steel weld. It's done professionally to a high level of quality. It's pretty strong. I would be very surprised if we saw any damage even from a, a, a soot fire inside the, um, uh, inside the heat exchanger. So I'm not, I'm not too scared of that, to be honest. And you're not afraid that the things will melt? Or? No. No, they're not. It doesn't get. By the time it gets over there, so obviously the gases come out here. If it was sitting in the top of here, just above the heat riser, then yeah. So one of the things, one of the classic mistakes that people make building one of these things is they think, hey, we've got some found materials. We'll try and build it out of a little bit of old chimney to make the heat riser. Bad idea. Like within a few burns, you'll find that the metal is just starting to crumble into dust because the heat that you're generating inside this thing is so intense that any kind of steel, uh, any kind of metal in there is just gonna get shredded over a fairly short period of time, which is why people generally build them out of fire bricks or cast refractory concrete. They're, it's very important not to use uh, metal materials. The, the only exception to this is the 
is the secondary air intake at the bottom but this uh, fortunately is at the bottom of the firebox so that a lot of the heat is obviously rising and secondly it's got a continuous current of cold air coming through it so it doesn't take as much of a beating it's also quite easy to remove because it's just in the bottom of the firebox so you can pull it out yeah. if it eventually fails it's a cheap easy piece of uh, uh, two bits of tubing that you can then just replace um, but inside the, the stove, the core in the heat riser and the firebox, you really don't want uh, much in the way of metalwork, otherwise it's going to die. But once it gets into the oven and starts to lose its heat to the, the mass of the oven, lose its transfer around the rest of the stove, uh, you're not dealing with kind of 800 degrees anymore, you're yeah. dealing with uh, three, 400 degrees. And at that point, the metal obviously gets hot, but it's not. Uh, a huge risk. The one thing you do need to um, to be aware of, we built, um, you can you can have a look here, we built, in order to control how we use the heat from the oven, we built some um, little baffle plates, some little metal plates that, uh, that switch over, you can probably see inside the oven uh, as I move it, yeah. uh, you, move it. you can move the this over and this shuts off the heat exchanger in favour of a bypass uh, to uh, to so we don't if we've got enough hot water we don't boil the thing I, I forgot I left this open first time we fired it and uh, we maxed out the temp temperature sensor at 128 degrees uh, and had a lot of steam coming out of places so it's quite important that we can shut that off um, but when we made quite tricky then because it's not like automatic this thing well so it is automatic in the sense that this was before I programmed the logic of the pump um, and I was doing everything manual. So the, um, now there is a, there's a piece of software that's running this. Uh, I'm using a home automation platform uh, and a bunch of kind of home programmed stuff as well. Uh, and now, as long as that's all running, which it does 24 seven in the house, uh, if it detects that the temperature of the heat exchanger has risen too high, uh, it will start to pump uh, water through into our heat store tank uh, in, the, in the other room. Uh, and that means we're capturing that heat and we're also keeping the heat down in here. And if that gets too hot and that gets too hot, then there's an alert that comes onto the phone to say, oh, OK, we need to, happen, yeah, yeah, you need to lose some heat somehow. Um, and then we can, uh, if this happens, it's not happened so far. We've not reached that point. Like it's usually possible to, like we can come and shut the, the plates, it cuts off the heat to it. It's not a big problem. Worst case, if it happens too much, I might have to find a way of building a heat dump to extract yeah, yeah. the heat out to dump it into a tube that goes through the soil or something. But I don't, I don't anticipate needing to do that. But the reason I mentioned this was uh, I nearly made a very serious mistake when making these plates because, of course, when you heat a piece of sheet steel by 400 degrees, it gets bigger. <laughs> and so I had to do some last minute adjustments because I suddenly realized before we built the whole thing together, this is gonna be a centimeter longer by the time it's finished firing. <laughs> Fortunately, we thought about that just before we built the rest of the oven around it. Otherwise it would have been very awkward. <laughs> but that's the, that's the other consideration with putting bits of metal in the middle of it. They, they're gonna do that a lot. A big board, a rigid board of uh, ceramic fibre, rigidised ceramic fibre insulation to try and keep the heat in. Uh, this thing is going to get installed back. At the moment this is just, this is only like slotted in here basically, but um, uh, we will eventually cover this all over and render it when we're happy with the performance of the stove. But it fits quite snugly into the gap at the moment. Uh, so we can in, and we can put the bottom piece in. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is reconnect the uh, the water connections. Uh, so we'll take the temporary caps off the tubing. Try and install the correct fittings as quickly as possible. Get water everywhere. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, something that changed my life here is discovering Teflon thread, not the tape, but the, the dental floss type stuff, uh, which has got some sort of slightly sticky uh, compound in it. 
and it is so much better than the Teflon tape. And they're, they're now like, you put Teflon on something once and then you can undo it and redo it and undo it and redo it and it lasts forever and it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. <laughs> One thing, another top tip if you're doing projects like this, I'll just check that's still got the washer on it, yep, is always use lots of unions, uh, what they call raco loco, loco here, like a, a mad union and I don't know why they call it that but it's a it's a free union that can spin separately because it's very easy to end up doing all of your plumbing having built this beautiful connections everywhere and then you realize once it's put together you can't undo it because everything needs to turn at the same time um, so having these free a bunch of these free unions in the plumbing means that when you do need to adjust things and fix them uh, you can get things to come apart uh, and it, it makes life a lot easier it's the kind of thing that doesn't get done in a lot of domestic plumbing uh, because the plumbers are like interested in doing the job and getting it done as cheaply as possible uh, and they're not interested in what happens in 20 years time when you want to adjust something or add something or because that's not their problem it's going to be somebody else that's dealing with it um, so um, this makes a, a big difference so and then I turn the taps back on in here so <coughs> next task is to you like this thing. Right, so good selection of things to put on here. Now the funny thing about these stoves is they burn uh, best upside down. So you put, instead of building a fire from the bottom up like you would normally and lighting it from underneath, you build the fire uh, and you light it from on top. Um, and the reason for that is uh, this thing can burn uh, very, uh, very hot and very fast, uh, and it can actually burn too fast for its own good. It, it will actually, if you let this thing burn as fast as it wants to, it will actually produce so much uh, carbon out of the wood so quickly that it can't even, even with the secondary airflow and the front wide open. Um, so this, actually, you can see here, where we're reason the insulation is still here, is that we're thinking about the idea of putting a door on this, um, and we're still debating whether it burns better with or without the door. Um, um, we've got a little piece of board that we're propping up against the front to control the oxygen flow uh, without the door, and if we can make it work without the door, it's obviously less effort, less money. We don't have to find a way of making up a door or getting one made or buying one um, if uh, but if it, the downside is it tends to pull more oxygen through which burns really well but it also cools the cools the output gases down because you're putting more cold air into the beginning of the fire um, so it, it's a trade-off um, but we're, we're still experimenting with that at the moment so what we do now is we put our yeah, it's not going to break. We put our kindling wood in at the back. We put some wood right up at the back up here, some smaller, more readily burnable pieces. And then we're going to put some even smaller bits uh, in front of that, on top of that. Uh, and then we're going to put some paper in the front to, to, to start it off. And what will happen is once it gets, once it, the draft catches, it will burn front to back it will burn through, catch that wood on fire, that will start to burn and then it will slowly burn down and because obviously it's burning down it doesn't catch the rest of the wood as quickly uh, which means that the, you're only burning a part of the stack of wood at any given point and that means that it doesn't go into a kind of runaway mode where it burns uh, too fast in one go. Uh, once you've had this thing lit once if you want to then restack it. One of the downsides of this design, as far as I can see, is that you can't then refill it completely because if you do, it will go and it really generates a lot of soot. So you then have to feed it a bit more slowly. You probably feed it once every half an hour, 40 minutes or something, put half load in it and it will catch from underneath and burn generate lots of heat but it won't go too crazy if you don't fill the thing too full. A 
actually the best thing to light this with would be a uh, broom but I don't I haven't collected any recently uh, but we've got lots around here and that goes up like a rocket um, it's actually the easiest thing to light fires with uh, but we have quite a bit of paper despite our best efforts to not acquire unnecessary paper we live in Spain and everything has a piece of paper associated with it especially if you deal with the government so uh, we have more paper than we want and at least now we don't have to throw it away uh, we can use it to light our fire moment of truth going to see is this thing is going to have a tendency to want to burn forwards initially you get the smoke coming out the front uh, because it hasn't yet started the draft to the back once the flames start going we'll give it a little bit of gentle encouragement starting to burn backwards oh it's coming out a bit no And there it goes. The flames are now being sucked into the, the back of the fire uh, rather than coming out the front. And slowly you'll start to hear an increasing roaring sound. Lift up. As the rocket takes off. A good sound. So now it's it's going and gently over. Now we can start to see the smoke is now coming out of the chimney at the top here. And if you come around, you'll see the smoke is coming all the way through the, the bench, all the way around and coming out of the top of the chimney. And as that heats up, it will start to burn better uh, and draw through more effectively. It takes a, a, a few minutes to really start drawing well. When it first starts and the draw isn't really powerful, there are a few gaps in the, in the brickwork, so it's still leaking a bit. It's leaking a bit around the top, around the sides. It's all stuff that we don't really want to spend lots of time and energy on until we're confident that this shape and this structure works. We don't want to be spending money rendering it and then have to break it all down afterwards, so. The biggest lesson to take away from it was uh, we followed the, the sizings of the main core of the thing very precisely um, uh, and that burns really nicely and really well. Uh, but we, we were forced to experiment a bit more with the sizing of the output and the, the, the brick part and the bench uh, because there's a lot of insulation in this. It's not just directly giving heat to the outside world. A lot of it we're trying to contain either because we want it to go into the heat exchanger or because we want it to stay in the oven. And that uh, meant that the calculations were much more complicated to, to do because Peter's calculations are based on square meters of brick radiating out to the outside world and I think what we did was we we put too much load on the stove so uh, it's tricky we had a deadline that we wanted to meet uh, probably the best thing to have done would have been to have built the core and then maybe dry laid uh, if we had loads of time to do it dry laid different designs of this without mortaring them uh, tried some different relative designs this is what Peter does a lot when he builds stoves uh, to experiment with which ones work best. And if we, if we were to do something like this again, I would probably do that. The materials cost was probably, in total with everything, I think it could probably have come to getting on for three or 4,000 euros. Um, but uh, the important thing to remember is that you could build a very much simpler version of the uh, of the stove uh, without especially if you didn't need the heat exchanger side um, uh, for very significantly less money the the core part of this 
um, the, the, the actual stove and the masonry heater part and the pizza oven part, you could build for, I think, especially if you did all of the work yourself and you found a bunch of materials locally, um, you could build it for probably less than a thousand euros, uh, maybe even kind of five, six hundred euros. It's, it's not the, the fundamental core of the stove is not an expensive thing to build. What made this expensive was trying to do some funky things with the heat, the water heating uh, and multi-purpose kind of multi-function stuff that made it a bit more complicated. But um, the, the great thing about these stoves is they can be built very cheaply out of very simple materials without having to invest lots and lots of money. Um, you could build the, the bench out of cob and rocks, uh, which is free. Uh, you could build the core out of fire bricks and refractory cement, which are not expensive. Uh, you can cast your own refractory for the chimney, or you can, there's a design if you have a good cutting wheel, uh, like a tile cutter, or you can borrow one, you can make an octagon heat riser out of cut fire bricks. It's more work uh, on the brick laying, but probably overall it's not any more work than casting the chimney. Uh, and um, uh, then you can just, you, the, you don't have to worry about making uh, castable refractory. You can make castable refractory as well. It's not that difficult. We did it by smashing up a bunch of fire bricks and mixing it with refractory cement and a bit of sand. Uh, and it made, it's, that's what the top of the firebox is made out of. And it's fine. It hasn't cracked. It hasn't, it's been burnt quite a few times now. It's holding, it's holding great. So uh, all of this stuff can be done pretty cheaply if you, if you want to do just the core oven mass heater thing, it could be done for a few hundred euros easily. Nearly at 100, which is, uh, it takes a while, there's a lot of mass in there to heat up, but it's burning well enough now that I'm going to start putting the, uh, the gases through the heat exchanger. So I'm going to open this side and the other part of that heat exchanger and lift that up. And now, ah, need to plug the temperature sensor back in, otherwise it won't know what to do. We can look at our home assistant platform, which is the home automation platform that uh, we use for the for all of the, the house and see if we can start to see. The boiler top temperature is still only 20 degrees. It's not very hot at the moment. But that's gonna start now that we've opened up that thing. That's, that, that figure is gonna start to rise quite rapidly. Um, uh, I, I might need to turn the pump on to blow the air out of it, that's the only thing, but it should, that should, that should increase quite quickly now that we've started to put the air through the, the heat exchanger. Uh, and then once that reaches, so that's already started to go up, that's now 21, uh, it will accelerate now much more quickly, it's obviously got a big block of steel to heat up, but once that starts rising, when it gets to, I think it's uh, 70 degrees, the pump kicks in automatically. Uh, and starts then pumping the water around uh, to, to transfer that heat to the main storage tank. This is where the magic happens. This is where the magic happens. So this is the thousand liters of uh, dead water, basically. This is just uh, purely a heat storage medium. That water doesn't touch anything else. That's what goes through the, the heat exchanger is what goes through the solar panels, but it doesn't go through the floor of the radiant floor and it doesn't go in, obviously it's not the floor, the water that we, uh, have for our house that that's all heated by copper coils that are inside this tank uh, that then extracts the heat out um, but uh, this way we've got a way of storing water uh, heat flexibly that we can then use for lots of different applications later on one of the downsides obviously of building a multi-purpose system is it's never as good at any one of the functions as uh, having a single purpose dedicated tool but we thought that it was worth doing because our space heating needs are not so extreme uh, and uh, we'd rather have a multi-purpose thing that serves many functions than just building a single purpose uh, water heating device that then we can't do anything else with when we don't need it. It's really rocketing now you can really hear the roar at the back so now we're now we're getting a bit closer now we've got uh, uh, boiler top temperature, so the, the top of the heat exchanger is now 51.75, so we've heated 100 litres of water by, uh, well, probably not a whole 100 litres, but we've heated the top of the tank by quite a considerable amount now, uh, and that will keep on, it's rising by a degree every few seconds, so fairly shortly 
that's going to start pumping um, and then we'll see you can monitor the status of all of the so we've got rocket boiler pump status is off at the moment uh, and that will then come on and start pumping there and we've got this is all it's a great little tool this um, it's fairly uh, advanced I guess in that it's more aimed at you can use it as a as a kind of non programmer um, if you use the existing modules but to get the best out of it uh, you probably want to I'm just going to shut this for the flies um, you probably want to, to be able to add and extend it a bit but there's a big community of people who are quite helpful who who uh, are pretty good at um, uh, chipping in and telling you how to do things and it's open source very flexible integrates with everything and it's a great platform for if you're wanting to build some uh, of your own home automation things whether it's a heating system or a kind of stuff in the house with lights and whatever um, it, it's a great alternative to buying into one of the commercial controlled ecosystem things where you have to buy all of their uh, custom gear you're giving all your data to a big corporation it, it's a it's a nicer alternative it's called home assistant home assistant yeah but you have to be a little bit of a whiskey to um, you need to be a little bit technical, right, uh, to, to start with. Um, you can get somewhere without having lots of technical knowledge. Um, certainly you need to be willing to get your hands a bit dirty with like configuring things, playing with things. It's not, it's not super easy to use, um, but there are, there's a good community of people who are very helpful. So like people will help you out if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing. If you're like really technophobic, don't like computers it's probably not for you uh, but um, it's not it's not that you really need it that have some sort of automation in here yeah I mean you there are other ways of doing this right you can you can buy off-the-shelf components that like there are systems designed for solid fuel heating systems you could buy uh, a temperature sensor that goes directly into uh, a pump trigger that's pre-configured, you say, you buy something that has a certain sensor, whatever. You can do all of this in a much more low-tech way, uh, just less flexible. The problem is that air bubble uh, didn't get blown out by the pump. What we're gonna have to do is uh, repressurize it with a bit of extra water. So there was an air bubble from where we let the water out. Uh, and it's it's not managing to pump through, uh, so I'm going to put a bit of extra water in to blast the air bubble out. Oops, no. Ooh, ow, 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 ow. It's just bleeding there. Okay. So now it's running. <laughs> I was a little little panic because the uh, air bubble was in the in the top of the heat exchanger. The pump wasn't able to blow the air bubble through, so the pump wasn't moving the water, and as a result, the boiler got to 90 degrees uh, in the top because uh, 95, in fact. Um, uh, so now uh, the uh, the tank is now. It dropped in temperature again. Uh, it's just about to kick in with 69.94 degrees after blasting a bunch of cold water through it from the from the from the tap. Um, uh, but that we we can just we've got a little fill valve at the bottom and we can use it to fill up and uh, uh, blow the air bubble out. Uh, and then now it's uh, you can now see that the rocket boiler pump is now running uh, and the boiler temperature is now starting to drop. Um, because it's it's actually getting cold water into the bottom of it, and then it's going to kind of reach an equilibrium where it starts to have a to heat the water uh, to the right amount. Um, in fact, to be honest, with all the sun we've had today, we're probably going to have to shut the thing pretty quickly because it's it's going to get too hot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tank. yeah, because the buffer tank is already at uh, nearly all 66, 67 degrees just from the sun today. So we don't need this for the water. We're going to see if it works with the, with the, with the just to, to test what we've done with the chains. But we're probably going to have to turn it off pretty quickly because it's just going to boil it. Uh, and what's your maximum temperature for the, for your buff tank? 
about I, w I don't like going above 70 uh, because, because it's uh, so the buffer tank is made of plastic uh, we got a cheap rainwater tank it's a thick plastic it's a good quality heavy duty plastic but it's still plastic it meant it cost a few hundred euros instead of a few thousand euros uh, and so that meant that we can um, uh, save a huge amount of money on that um, uh, but it means that we have to be careful about not heating it too much if we heat it up to which I have done once to uh, 95 degrees, it starts popping seals where the plastic starts to soften around the edge, which you really don't want because it's a big pain in the neck. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's time to make some pizzas. I think we're nearly ready to start cooking. Uh, the body of the stove is now at 200. What we do when we want to get pizzas cooking really hot is we get everything around hot, get the basic temperature at 200, and then we throw in some really quick burning wood uh, just to give it a boost and then we can get it up to three, 350, 400 even to get like a super quick Neapolitan style pizza. Anyway, uh, I should go and start preparing some dough. 260. 260 and now this is burning really well, really fiercely. I'm now going to start shutting down the oxygen uh, so that we're not putting quite as much cold air through the fire. It doesn't need it anymore. Everything's warm. It's putting air nicely through. Um, uh, we're going to um, uh, now focus on trying to keep the heat in the stove as much as possible uh, and this should allow the temperature to rise faster in the oven. I wonder if you can, uh, you can now see if you look a faint glow on the underside there of the of the pizza stone where that's the that's the uh, the fire reflecting up yeah. that's the burn going on in the in the chimney. Yeah, 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 yeah. This Oh. Yes, you just do 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 do. Yeah. Oh, shit. No. Another. No, no if no. you put it down again. Yeah. Then you have okay. to do a second base. <laughs> so, yes. I'm a professional pizza oven builder. I'm not a professional pizza pizza cooker. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So I really love the whole thing, the only yeah. thing, which you said also before, mm. is, the, is the working height, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a fix. Yeah, yeah so I mean... It's to look if they're done. Yeah, but uh, also uh, this pizza oven is made very selfishly because I'm 1m83 tool, so for me it's okay, but everybody else, well, hey, it's their problem. <laughs> no, but the rocket stove height is too... Is kind of fixed. I guess we would like to build one too. But no, you could, he's got this other design that I was saying to Jasper before. That they've changed the design so you don't need to have the, the heat riser vertical and you can have a, uh, a, a lower path and so you can build a much smaller stove. That pizza needs <laughs> uh, to come 30 out. seconds there. gone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So this was it for today and I'm um, just saying this magical oven hits this beautiful bench so when it's cold outside you can still sit and snuggle. It boils the water for the heating for the floor heating in the house and it cooks really delicious pizzas. Thanks for uh, sharing this amazing uh, it's okay. My pleasure. story. Um, uh, it's, been, it's been fun uh, and everyone loves pizza so what's not to love? Yum yum! Cheers! <laughs>